My name is Ellen Grant, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at GMRI, and I'm really pleased to be able to welcome you uh, to this lecture. If you don't know GMRI, I suspect many of you have been here before, I, I see some familiar faces, but if you don't know us, we pioneer collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges. That's our mission, and what it means is, is that we're focused intensely in the Gulf of Maine, um, but we're working on problems that really pertain to the whole globe. And as you can imagine right now, one of those problems is climate change. And the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans, and so we're right on the front edge of that and really trying to learn as much as we can about the ecosystem, um, both to be able to be adaptive here in the Gulf of Maine, but also to be able to um, work with the rest of the world on some of these, these challenges, learn from them, share with them. We do that uh, mission really through science research, um, community engagement, and science education. And this room is more typically used for middle school children. We bring in almost 10,000 kids a year um, to have a half day experience, an immersive experience where they're actually working on science questions that our researchers are working on. And it really gives them an authentic experience, come on in, of, um, of science, uh, and hopefully a really positive experience of this is something they'd like to do more of and, and ultimately understand better, uh, whether they become scientists or science teachers or fishermen or whatever they might become, um, or citizens of the Gulf of Maine. So um, before I introduce our uh, speaker, a um, couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the restrooms are out and behind to the right and then off to the left, so feel free to, to excuse yourself if you need to. Um, we ask no food and drink in the auditorium here. Um, and I do want to acknowledge our sponsor for our C-State lecture series, which is the Morton Kelly Charitable Trust. Um, without whose support, we really couldn't have this series. This series, as you um, hopefully have seen in your program, is Women Who Are Changing Seafood. And Tove Braun is um, a great example of that. You've got a, a little bit of a bio um, in your program, but I'm gonna give you a few high points here. Ta uh, Tove has, has worked within Maine's commercial fishing and seafood industries for over 20 years and um, is very passionate about scallops and the scallop industry and is really a leader in that industry. She um, actually has worked at GMRI, so she's a, a well-known uh, figure in our lab and um, very much remembered fondly. Um, and she's also very well-known in our lab these days because of her product, which is the Daybo scallops. The and the world. They are absolutely <laughs> the best in the world. I will, I will give full testimony to that. So she's gonna tell you a little bit about her journey and um, please help me in welcoming Coach Ron. Thank you. So hearing's okay and everything? Sorry. Um, so I'm, my name is Toad Braun, and I'm here to talk about my very favorite subject in the world, which is Maine scallop fishery and Maine scallops. Um, and it's kind of an interesting, I'm really happy to be here tonight because I speak I'm not going to say on a fairly regular basis, but you know, a few times a year I'm given the opportunity to speak about Maine scallop fishery, but it's always for five minutes or ten minutes, so I can go into detail on one tiny little subject, or maybe I can skirt a couple. Um, but when the folks at GMRI asked me a couple months ago to do this, I just said, oh yeah, of course, I'll no, never have a problem talking about scallops. Uh, and then I found out uh, about a month ago that I would have the chance to speak for 45 minutes. So. The problem was not what am I going to speak about, but like how do I finally handle the fact that I can get into, in particular you'll see, I'll get very excited when I talk about one particular thing. There's one particular issue that I, I don't get a chance to talk about very much. I'm very passionate about it and you are going to find out about it soon. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run down um, a quick background on how I got started and then I'll get into the thing that I'm really passionate about. I've got these notes here to keep me on track because when I start talking about scallops, it's very easy for me to get off track because I get into tangents and get really excited. Um, so what do I do? Some of you may know about my business, Down East Dayboat, where I ship the world's best scallops across country within 24 hours of harvest so folks across the country can taste the difference a day makes. 
Um, that is just a tool that I'm using towards my goal. My goal is to make Maine scallop fishery more sustainable and more profitable. And I figure by showing the world that Maine produces the very best scallops in the world, in fact, they're nothing like scallops from the trip boat federal fishery, that will help me to make the fishery more profitable. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I wanted to talk first about um, how I got to where I am. So as Ellen mentioned, I've been involved in fisheries in one way or another for almost 30 years. If you count starting out fishing on my father's lobster boat with him, it's over 30 years. Um, I didn't set out to be involved in fisheries. My undergraduate degree is in geology. Um, but I've always worked multiple jobs, and the only jobs I've ever liked have had to do with seafood or fisheries. So just by nature of the way things go, I've gotten deeper and deeper and broader and broader, as it turns out, into fisheries over the years. Um, I'm not going to bore you with a long list of all the things that I've done, but uh, I've sold seafood retail and wholesale. I have sold commercial fishing trade shows in the U.S. and Argentina. I was a French translator at a European seafood exhibition. I've worked here at the Gulf of Maine, the Maine Research Institute. Um, I've done fisheries research and advocacy. I've written for commercial fisheries news. Um, and I have worked as a fisheries manager. So there are some interesting stories along the way of how I came to get my master's in marine policy at the University of Maine. Those are best told over a beer and not all appropriate for here. So. I'm going to skip ahead to where the, uh, the real good stuff starts, which is when I started at the Department of Marine Resources. So I started at the Department of Marine Resources, which is the entity that governs Maine state water fisheries, in the fall of 2007. And as a, an indicator of how important lobster is to the state, I was one of two resource management coordinators. There was one for lobster and one for everything else, and I was the latter. Um, and my boss at the time, Terry Stockwell, said, there's way too much for any one person to do. You can't possibly get everything done. But the good part of that is you get to choose what you want to focus on. And I focused on scallops. Um, our scallop fishery in Maine was in the toilet. Um, it had been managed for decades, not for the sake of the scallop fishery, but really for the sake of the lobster fishery. The vast majority of those people that fish for scallops in the state of Maine are lobstermen that need something to do in the winter, and so they'll fish for scallops when scallops happen to be present. Um, and so almost all the regulations that we had in the fishery were put in place to prevent conflict with lobsters, the lobster fishery. So that means there was a 10-foot maximum drag, drag size, and the big thing was a season. You could only fish from November 1st, and then that was changed eventually to December 1st, through April 15th. So basically, you could fish when the lobster fishery was, was ebbing. And you can see how well that worked. Uh, it bottomed out and showed absolutely no sign of improving. But I am someone that likes to, uh, like to take on challenges. And I noticed that at the time that this was going on, in so focus on whoops, these years here, the time that that was going on, that's what was going on in the federal fishery. Our fishery was in the toilet and theirs was exploding. Why did that happen? It happened because of this, because they closed areas. The uh, federal government was sued in the, the mid-1990s because uh, groundfish stocks weren't recovering. So a number of stakeholders got together and sued them and said, you need to do what you're supposed to do, which is to manage fisheries for maximum sustainable yield, maximum benefit to the, you know, not just to the fishermen, but to the, the private sector, people that like to eat seafood, you gotta do something. So they implemented a number of large area closures they prohibited fishing for anything with any, with any gear ca capable of catching ground fish, and scallop dredges were included. So large areas were off limits to all fishing, including scallop drags. And it didn't work for ground fish, but it worked like that for scallops. So the fishery went gangbusters. There is pretty much nothing certain in fisheries management other than the fact that you're never going to please everybody. But the closest you're going to get in terms of a species uncertainty is scallops. If you have a large number of scallops on the floor, if you, if you, seafloor, if you leave a certain number on the seabed and you let them alone, you don't bother them, they will grow and they will multiply. In fact, they will generally grow 25 to 50% per year. So if you had a bank account that was yielding 25 to 50% per year, would you spend down the principal or would you leave it alone and live like a fat cat off the interest? Very easy answer. You might take out a little bit if you really needed to eat, but you'd sit there and you'd wait, like, was it Silas Marner with his gold? You'd wait, you know, and, and watch it explode. 
But that is going to change, obviously, if everyone in your neighborhood can make withdrawals on that account. And that's the problem that happens with common property resources like fisheries. All those fishermen know if I leave that scallop there, it'll grow and I'll get more next year. But they also know if they leave that scallop, fisher, scallop on the floor, Joe Schmo is going to go and take it. Because we all know he fishes way longer than you should. And the resource shows what happens as a result of that. So what is the solution? The solution is fisheries management. Fisheries managers need to step in and put regulations in place, hopefully that are supported by the fishermen so that they'll actually abide by them, to allow resources to, to grow. And as I mentioned, scallops, it's a pretty clear thing. We know that if you close areas, they're going to come back. So why wasn't that happening? And this is a prime reason why it's not happening, because there are very few people that like to stand in front of a crowd of men like that and piss them off. <laughs> and fortunately, I am one of those rare few that sort of likes to do that. Um, and I want to make it clear, I don't like to do that, you know, just to be mean, but if I know that something needs to be done, I really like a challenge. Um, oops, put some of my notes here. So it's not just that you have to deal with the angry fishermen, it's also that the problem of scientific uncertainty. Especially in the state of Maine, we need to go to the legislature to get really controversial things accomplished. And the arguments that the scientists put out there, and scientists are not always the most effective speakers. There are some great ones here at GMRI, but oftentimes they're very dry and they're going to stand up there in front of the legislature and they're going to say, I can tell you with a 80% confidence interval that if you do this within the next three years, you might have this. So he sits down and some fisherman gets up there and says, my daughter has asthma and if you do what this person is saying, I can't pay my heating bill next winter, they're going to side with the fishermen. Um, major decisions have to be made by people that don't always have the expertise to really be able to make them and it's not their fault, it's just the way the system is. And when they're not sure what to do, the easiest, so the easiest thing to do is nothing at all. And so fisheries stay depleted. It's a lot easier to do nothing than it is to do something. Um, the feds at least had a legal requirement. They were obligated to do something. So I remember when I was at DMR thinking, geez, I wish that we could get sued. I wish there was something that we could point to and say, we have to do this. Um, but we didn't, and so we had to just force it down people's throats. Um, but my mission was to bring the scallop fishery back, and I was not going to take no for an answer. And it wasn't just me doing this. I, I was leading the charge, but the department had made a decision a few years earlier that you know, we need to do something about scallops and about urchins and about mussels. And scallops just happened to be the one that I was tackling at the time. So my mission was to bring the fishery back, um, and I was going to do it with carrots and sticks. I, I've seen a probably heard of some of my carrot things, but I also, we had a scallop advisory council in the state of Maine. Um, the Department of Marine Resources needs to get advice on, before they do certain things in certain species. And in scallops, you need to be advised by the scallop advisory council, which is a group of fishermen and dealers and scientists. And when I came on board in September of 2007, it was largely defunct. It hadn't met for a long time. And when I had to make some calls to replace some people, they were saying, I'm not going to join that. Geez, all they ever do is get together and, and talk about nothing and talk about how they, when they were a kid, what they, how they used to catch scallops. So I was able to place a few people. I said, take a chance. I think something's going to change. So I put some new people on there. I started baking cookies for all the scallop meetings. I brought coffee. I, baked, I had one big thing where I had clam cakes, a clam cake lunch with chocolate peanut butter dessert because I found out that one of the guys that was particularly difficult, that was his favorite dessert. Um, <laughs> And so my coworkers, I, I like this quote, one of them said, Tog, you're like uh, seven parts Robocop and three parts cheerleader. <laughs> and so we were able to make a number of changes to Maine State scallop fishery. And the big ones up there, um, most of these happened in the, in the first two years that I was at DMR. The guys you say, Tog, let this work before you go to the next thing. Um, we cut the fishery almost in half. It had been December 1st to April 15th. That was the season. We had them select days within that. So we cut it down to 70 days, and we had the three, we had three year conservation closures that were established statewide. And that's not the, yeah, okay. Um, and it was almost 20% of the coast that we closed for three years. Um, let's see. First attempt at doing that failed. Second attempt worked in 2009. Um, so they were closed in. They're as of December of 2009, and they didn't reopen until 2012. 
So the question was, once we close them, okay, now what are we going to do? Because it was, it was hard enough to close them, but it was going to be a lot harder to figure out how are we going to reopen them so that it's not just a gold rush and then it gets wiped out all of a sudden. So we held meetings up and down the coast. I met with a lot of fishermen at kitchen tables and in libraries and in wheelhouses um, to try to figure out how we were going to reopen them in a way that would yield long-term sustainable benefits. And at one of those meetings at the Jonesport High School, I think it was the spring of 2010, um, one of my favorite fishermen, Morris Alley, said, you know, Tog, I wouldn't mind lowering the limit further because we, we had implemented a 200-pound daily limit. Prior to that, there was no limit at all. You could take as many as you wanted on any trip. The limit was 200 pounds. And he said, I wouldn't mind lowering it further if I knew what I was going to get paid when I came in, but I never know what I'm going to get paid. And so I had sort of like an Oprah aha moment. Like, why is Morris Alley that's coming in, that, you know, that's what he's bringing in for catch that day. Why is Morris Alley that's coming in in Jonesport with scallops, 80 pounds of scallops that he hauled over the past four hours, why is his price being set by the offshore trip boat fishery where guys are at sea for six to eight days at a time, sometimes 10 or 12 days, and they come in with thousands of pounds of scallops that were caught God knows when. Um, so this is just a, an indicator. What they're doing right there, this is important, they, they store their catch over the course of the trip in cloth bags buried in ice. That ice melts and is absorbed by the scallops because scallops are like sponges. You've probably heard about dry scallops before. Supposedly dry scallops are scallops that have not been soaked in solutions. Well, even if they haven't been soaked in tripolyphosphate, which is a common thing for people to do, they've absorbed water over the course of the trip. So there's studies that show that the percentage, the moisture content of scallops <coughs> at the end of a trip is actually quite a bit higher than natural moisture content. And, and in fact, um, France will not import US sea scallops for, for the most part because they have very strict regulations on what the moisture content can be and US sea scallops don't make it. My notes here. So here I was I'm like, okay, we need to do something about this. We've, we've closed these areas. We need to figure out how to reopen them, we, but we also need some dealers to, f to focus on Maine scallops. We're producing an amazing product. So I decided, as I mentioned earlier, I always worked multiple jobs. So I was working at the department full time and I was working at Jay's, waitressing, still do. Um, and I said, well, I want to start a seafood business. But the AG said, so you can't manage a fishery and profit from it. That, that would be sort of the definition of a conflict of interest. So <clears throat> the only way that I could do that would be if I, if I quit DMR. And I loved my job. So there was no way that I was going to do that. And then LePage was elected, and he put Norm Olson in charge of, um, it, it replaced George with, um, George LaPointe with Norm Olson, who is a very difficult personality person. Um, and I decided, okay, I'm ready to leave to start my own business. So I started Down East Day Boat. And we're doing well in the time because I said, okay, if it's about quarter past now, then we're good. Um, so I started out selling just in Maine, just to restaurants, and I wound up selling almost entirely by shipping across country directly to consumers. But that's something that I'm going to get into later. Right now, I want to talk about the thing that might be a bit confusing, so I'm going to take it slowly. Okay. Oops. Federal scallop fishery management. So I mentioned, I showed the slide earlier about the Maine state water fishery. The state of Maine manages out to three miles. The federal government, via the New England Fisheries Management Council and the National Marine Fisheries Service, manages from three miles out to 200 miles. So this is the Gulf of Maine. This is what we're going to be in, end up talking the most about. That's what I'm passionate about. I really don't care what happens down there to a great extent. But the majority of the scala fishery occurs on George's Bank and in the Mid-Atlantic. At the time that this story started, almost nothing was going on in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and in the federal scallop fishery, there are two types of boats. There are the large limited access boats that I'm going to refer to as the trip boats. And there's the general category boats that have an individual fishing quota. They are smaller day boats. The number of trip boats was set back in the 1990s. Basically, if you had history, uh, if you met a certain history threshold, you were given one of these expensive, per what turned out to be expensive permits. You could qualify for a trip boat permit. So there was a set number of them, say it was 150 or so, and that number was never going to change. At the time, <clears throat> those boats that didn't qualify for those large trip boat permits 
we're allowed to have a, and what are called a general category permit. So those are the day boats. They could take up to 400 pounds per trip. And up until about 10 years ago, they were open access. Anyone that wanted one could get one. To understand the next part, you have to understand how allocation is given out in the fishery. Um, each year, I'm going to go back a slide actually. Oops. Each year, scientists do surveys, conduct surveys of Georgia's bank in the mid-Atlantic. And they figure out how many scallops, you know, the rough estimate, how many scallops are there within different sizes. From that, they figure out how many can we afford to, to sustainably remove. So that they look at the total harvestable biomass. And then they work, so they work with managers to say, here's what's there, here's how much we think can reasonably be taken out and not have the fishery suffer. Um, and then they have to figure out how to divvy that up. So they take the total harvestable biomass, and then they look at, okay, how many, <coughs> how many scallops are taken in on an average day at sea? And they divide the harvestable biomass by the average number taken in for day at sea, and they wind up with, okay, this is how many days at sea we think the fishery can support. And then they divide that up amongst the days at sea boats. So if you want to allocate 15 million pounds of scallops, and there are, say, 2,000 pounds caught per average per day at sea, that's, okay, 7,500 days. So this fishery can handle 7,500 days this year. If there are 150 boats, then each boat gets 50 days. And these are the type of boats that we're talking about, large scallop vessels. But that is just if there are days at sea boats. I mentioned there are also these other boats, the general category vessels. They're very small, and for a long time the fishery wasn't doing very well, and the percentage of the quota that they were taking was, was really small, inconsequential, maybe one, two, three percent tops. But then that happened, and there were a lot of scallops around, and all of a sudden guys were rushing into this general category fishery because that, it was a lucrative thing, and at that point there weren't a whole lot of lucrative fisheries going on because remember, ground fish was in the toilet at this point. So the percentage being taken by these days at sea boats started to grow. At one point, it was over 12%. So then when that happened, the fisheries managers, when they're allocating days at sea, in the beginning, they said, okay, we know that the, the, the uh, day boats are gonna take some, but not much, so we'll just look at that as an error, error figure. But then they started taking 12%, and the big boats were having their days at sea cut back because that amount was assumed to be taken by the, the smaller boats. So being incredibly sustainability-minded, the large days at sea boats, the trip boats, said, we need to do something for the resource here. This is, this is terrible. We need to do, you know, we need to control what's being taken by this fishery. And of course, they had a point in that they, you know, for the sustainability of the fishery, you need to control what's taken in. But what they were really doing is trying to preserve their share of the fishery. So they, the, what they did to make that happen was they implemented Amendment 11 to the Federal Fishery Management Plan for Scallops. That was very controversial. It took years to go through, but it capped the total amount, the percentage that was given to the general category, the day boat fleet, at 5%. And it also, once that 5% was set, it figured out how are we going to divvy that 5% up amongst all those day boats, because at that point there were a couple hundred day boats. The way they did that was how they often do it in fisheries, which is they base what percentage you would get of that 5% on your history in the fishery. So if you've been fishing for you know, the past four years and you got several thousand pounds a year, you would get more than someone that had just started fishing recently and had only gotten 50 pounds in the last year. That sounds fair enough, except the years that they chose to determine what percentage of that day boat pie you'd get were 2000 to 2004. And that's where Maine's scallop landings were at that point. There was nothing being caught in the Gulf of Maine, or I shouldn't say nothing, that's an exaggeration. There was very little being caught in the Gulf of Maine at that point. So if they had kept it, if they had just left it as that and say, okay guys, all you boats out there from Maine to New Jersey, we're gonna base what you can get in the future on 2000 to 2004, Maine would have been completely screwed. So, <clears throat> that wouldn't be fair, right? And unfortunately, the council doesn't always they're not always propelled by fairness, but sometimes they are. Um, and Terry Stockwell, who was my boss at the Department of Marine Resources, was able to convince them to come up with something different. And so the Northern Gulf of Maine Scallop Management Area was, was established. And a new type of day boat permit was established. It was the Northern Gulf of Maine permit. So the stuff that happened on Georgia's Bank in the Mid-Atlantic was still happening. Oops, other way around. I gotta get rid of the federal. So 
<coughs> the, the overall fishery was still being managed as it was before. There was a certain amount of scallops that folks figured would be taken away from there. You would either get a, day at, a certain number of days at sea or you'd get your quota that you could fish. But there was another area completely distinct set up here, and that was the Gulf of Maine, Northern Gulf of Maine management area. A lot of Maine guys did not qualify for the IFQ day boat permit, but they did qualify for the Northern Gulf of Maine permit because all you had to do to qualify for that was to have a general category permit between 2000 and 2004. <clears throat> so the way that this was going to be managed, they wanted it to be a, a, day, a true day boat fishery. They were thinking a lot of lobstermen would be able to participate in this um, certain times of the year. It was meant to be a bycatch fishery. This was not supposed to be a fishery where all I do is catch scallops. Um, they established it as uh, a 70,000 pound total allowable catch. That's where it's supposed to be capped at, and that was based on historic landings in the fishery. And each permit could fish for 200 pounds per day with a single 10 foot dredge. Um, they called it, they didn't have, Element 11, as I mentioned, was very controversial because people were fighting over what percentage they would get of the fishery. It, there was a lot of fighting going on. It took several years to put in place. This northern Gulf of Maine was, because there wasn't much going on there, they didn't put a whole lot of effort into this. And so they titled it sort of a placeholder for management if and when the fishery recovered. The problem was that it wasn't a very good placeholder um, because the way they managed it was there were limits for the northern Gulf of Maine permits. It's really hard to read this, but if you're, you can skip over that because those are the real small boats. If you're a northern Gulf of Maine permit, if you're fishing south of 4220, you can't fish, you can't fish at all south of 4220. So south, outside the northern Gulf of Maine, you can't fish at all. If you're fishing within it, you have to fish with a 10 foot dredge, 200 pound daily limit, and the landings are deducted from the tack, and once the 70,000 pounds is hit, it shuts down. If you're one of the other day boats, your allocation is assigned to you based on what's going on in Georgia's Bank in the Mid-Atlantic. But you can still fish in the Gulf of Maine if you want, as long as you abide by those regulations. So you can fish in the nor northern Gulf of Maine if you fish with a single 10-foot dredge, 10, 200 pounds per trip, and your landings are deducted both from your IFQ that was based on Georgia's Bank and from the northern Gulf of Maine tack. So that way it's not going to be exceeded. That seems reasonable. The problem is the days at sea boats were not given any restrictions in the Gulf of Maine other than the fact that once the quota was harvested by the smaller boats, they had to stop fishing. And it was said, well, the big boats aren't going to go up there because there's not much going on there. And I argued, but there's eventually going to be something going on there. And when that happens, these big boats can come up here and wipe the fishery out before the small boats have a chance to catch it. Um, but that didn't really work. It fell on dead ears. And part of the reason for that is that the council is a very political process. And the U.S. sea scallop fishery is the most highest value fishery in the country. And they can afford to pay lobbyists and lawyers to go and argue their case. Um, and oftentimes, regulations are made by the people that have the lion's share of the resources in order to preserve that lion's share of the resources. And that's sort of what happens with this. Um, so I was, I went to, after I left DMR in 2011, I still kept going to these meetings and arguing to get this fixed and it always fell on dead ears. I think they sort of looked at me as a quirky but passionate nuisance. Um, <laughs> and I just, I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep going until something happens. And then the larger trip boat fishery decided they wanted to be certified by the Marine Stewardship Council. So the Marine Stewardship Council is an, an organization based in London and they certify fisheries as sustainable. In order to get the, use the MSC logo on your product, you have to be able, you have to have your fishermen meet certain standards. And basically they're supposed to be sustainable and they're supposed to not discriminate and these sorts of things. Um, it's a very public process. If you want to get it, you have to, you have to have some money. You have to hire an auditor to apply the MSC standards. <coughs> they do a lot of research, talk with stakeholders. Then they put out a report that's open to public comment. Nobody usually comments on it and things stuff like this, and then it'll just get certified. So it is a public process, and I submitted comments. And I said, okay, this fishery is well managed outside the Gulf of Maine, but there's this issue going on, so we've got to do something about that. Um, my, my comments were taken by, they have to, all the others have to respond to anything that any comments made, but they basically brushed it under the rug and said, this is an, this is an inconsequential matter, it doesn't make any difference. Um, so they put the final report out and it was set to be certified. And fortunately, the MSC has a, a 
an option where you can object. So I objected. Um, and I submitted a formal letter of why I thought that fish fishery should not be certified. Um, this is something that's very rarely employed, partly because you have to spend $10,000 if you want to do this, which I was going to do on my own, but a very kind benefactor was able to, to donate some money so that I didn't have to spend it out of my own pocket. Um, in the 15, at the time, this was in 2013, in those 15 years that the MSC had existed, only 19 objections had moved forward. Um, so I filed my objection and I waited and they accepted it. And I get a little teary even thinking about it because it was really exciting because, oh my God, because I had told, you know, my, the fishermen and some guys at DMR, I'm going to do this. I'm like, oh, it's never going to go anywhere. And, but they accepted the objection. So then that set into motion a whole bunch of different wheels. Um, the MSC does not want it to move forward because it creates controversy. Um, so the American Scholar Federation had been looking at me as sort of a nuisance. Now they were really annoyed. In fact, one of their members at a, uh, a council meeting came up to me because they were supposed to be uh, certified in August. And because of me, it was postponed quite a bit. He said, Tog, I've got thousands of pounds of inventory that I can't sell because of you. And I'm like, Jeff, no, you can't sell it because there's a management problem. He said, there's not a management problem. And like, if there weren't a management problem, this objection wouldn't be moving forward. There is a management problem. Um, so what you're supposed to do in this situation is the parties that disagree are supposed to work things out. So the lawyer for the American Scholar Federation and the head of the, asso the association called me one day and I knew the call was coming, so I tape recorded it, thankfully. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to ask for. The first, I said, well, why don't you just certify everything but the Northern Gulf of Maine? Because I figured that would be a highlight to the fact that there's a problem, and then I could use that as leverage at the council to try to fix it. Um, they weren't willing to do that. And basically, they knew they had to call me, but they thought that they could just you know, wipe me aside. And so at one point, I said, well, part of the problem we have here is that there aren't good surveys of the Gulf of Maine. We need to be able to show what's there. And there's no money for representation. So if you want to set up a fund to, you know, to do some surveys and to pay for representation, then I'll withdraw my objection. So of course, that turned into, the next day, a letter that Tog Braun tried to extort money from us and said that she would, withdraw, she would withdraw her objection if we, we paid her off. <coughs> um, I was very glad that I had taped it. Um, and it wound up, I got, the Conservation Law Foundation was very nice because they gave me a law student to help with me because I had to go to New York to argue against this new Bedford lawyer with a judge that was flown in from London. I've never been more nervous in my entire life. I swear I didn't sleep for days. We got there, had the arguments. I presented my case. They presented their case. And then I waited. And it was dismissed. And what they said was, what the adjudicator said was, and I'll sort of highlight here, um, because there were a number of different arguments. One of one is the situation that this woman is describing has never happened in the past, so why should we think that it would happen in the future? Well, that's not how you manage fisheries, because by that token, any fishery that hasn't collapsed is ripe for MSC certification. Um, so he called it the theoretical possibility uh, is remote at best, and then also said that if it were to happen, then there was a management process in place that would correct it. So. Fast forward two years, this was in January of 2014. In 2016, I, was, I, I had started to get some, a lot of fishermen involved in this as well. And so uh, this is James West in the foreground and Jimmy Watton in the background. We were at a New England Fisheries Management Council meeting in Connecticut saying, listen guys, we found a nice pot of scallops on Stellwagen Bank and there are a shit ton of big boats out there. And that year, the quota for the Northern Gulf of Maine was set at 70,000 pounds. We went a little bit over that. We ended up catching 80, 89,000 pounds. And in the time it took us to get 89,000 pounds, which is the only way that the fishery can be closed down, because remember, it's open until the small boats catch it, the big boats harvested over 300,000 pounds. So the fishery, this thing that I, the theoretically possibility remote at best happened two years after that. Um, and what we're talking about, so these, this is a main boat fishing in the northern Gulf of Maine. That's the quantity that they're fishing in, that bringing in. This is the quantity that the large boats are fishing in. And to add insult to injury, there was this weird little provision that the days at sea boats could fish harder within the northern Gulf of Maine than they could outside the northern Gulf of Maine. We ended up getting that fixed that year, that year, but that's all that we got fixed. So we still were set up to have a repeat of that situation the following year. So this is just the letter that I 
sent to the council, read to the council, and just going to read that um, what they would say is at the council, well, there is, I would get up there and say there is no limit to what the, the large boats can take. And they would say, well, there is a limit. The, they have to use a day at sea. Well, the day at sea is based on Georgia Spank in the mid-Atlantic. So it makes no sense to do that. Because in that, what they're saying is there will be scallops left. Days at sea are set based on the resource. There will be scallops left somewhere. Well, that's like saying, OK, we're going to let a humongous trawler in and take every last lobster out of Long Island Sound. But it's fine, because there'll still be lobsters left in Maine. So it didn't make any sense. The next year, which was spring of 2017, over 30 boats, 30 days at sea boats showed up on Stellwagen Bank. This was uh, the radar for, taken from the Jacob and Joshua Alex Todd's boat. He was the only boat out there in the very beginning because the weather was so bad. So he was surrounded by large boats. And that is not a great photo, but you can see that's at night because they can fish around the clock, remember? They're fishing around the clock. These, our little boats were, were going out, catching their 200 pounds. They could only catch a 200 pounds per day. So they go out, take it, come back in, dump it, go out, immediately go back out, take their 200 pounds, come in, because they were racing to take as many scallops as possible, because the only way that that, fish, that area was going to close was if the small boats caught the quota. So as this was going on, of course, I was irate. The fishermen were irate. We ended up getting some pretty good press. The Boston Globe reported on it. We got Shelley Pingree's office involved. And I should say the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association <coughs> actually took the lead on this. Um, I was happy to have their assistance. They, they did a lot more than I did with this. They got, they got a lot of the senators involved. Um, and made, we all made calls to the National Marine Fisheries Service every day. John Bullard was very sick of hearing from all of us. Um, and it, what was so strange at the time is we were asking them to implement an emergency action. But one of the things that needs to, be, to occur in order for an emergency action to be justified was it has to be an unforeseen event. So when one of the reporter, I had a reporter friend that said when she was talking with, with one of the NOAA fisheries guys, he said, I'm not going to put this on the record, but part of the reason we can't do it is that Tog Braun's been telling us this is going to happen for the past eight years. <laughs> so how crazy is that is that if, it, if, we hadn't, if they hadn't known about it, they could stop it. But because they knew about it, they had to let it continue. Um, so <laughs> this is the landing. So that's 2016 when the small boats took 89,000 pounds and the big boats took 300,000. And also, just to let you know, because the small boats are pretty well regulated in the northern Gulf of Maine, because they went over their quota by 20,000 pounds in 2016, they had to have that deducted from their quota in 2017. So, which it makes sense if you don't look at the 300,000 pounds. In 2017, they were able to shut the fishery down early. They claimed that it was because they were afraid that reporting might have been delayed, but really it was political pressure. And in the time it took our guys to catch 44,000 pounds, 30,000 less than they were supposed to be able to, the big boats took out somewhere between 1.1 million and 1.7 million pounds for the northern Gulf of Maine. Um, oh, I skipped ahead. So that is really annoying. Um, but <laughs> the good thing is, is that that was such an embarrassment. NOAA Fisheries re really stood up and said, OK, we've got to do something to stop that from happening. So the issue has now been fixed. And I don't want to make them look like bad guys, and I don't want to make the council look like bad guys. Just as when I was at DMR, my boss said, you know, there's too much for you to do, which means that you can choose what you want to do. They choose to put out the biggest fires. And for a long time, there was just me going there complaining, and some very powerful people saying what she's going to say is never going to happen. So in 2016, there was, I would say no excuse for them not doing something to prevent 2017. But because that happened, we were actually in a pretty good position. Unfortunately, the recovery that started to happen that could have fostered a really nice fishery in the northern Gulf of Maine was completely obliterated. Um, but there are still scallops left there. And this Sunday, when the northern Gulf of Maine fishery opens, the big boats are not going to be allowed to be there. So happy, happy on that one. And I want to, uh, I think this is the time here. How are we doing on time? OK. Um, the good news is Maine scallop landings have gone up as a result largely of the, of the closed areas and the measures that I may have started, but a lot of other people have kept it going. Um, I will talk very briefly about my company, Down East Day Boat. I ship the best scallops in the world across the country within 24 hours of harvest so that people can taste the difference a day makes. I didn't realize when I started doing this just how amazing Maine scallops are. They truly are completely different from anything that you're going to taste from the trip boat fishery. 
partly because of the way they're handled, but also because the waters they come from produce a much better flavor scallop. Maine produces some amazing oysters. Maine also produces some amazing scallops. And we produce different varietals of scallops just as we do different varietals of oyster. Um, I brought some scallops to New York City about four years ago from three different areas, uh, Goolsboro Bay, uh, the Bold Coast off Cutler, and Casco Bay had 11 different chefs try them, and nine out of the 11 said, oh, I want those, which was the Goolsboro Bay scallops. And a woman at the University of Maine did her master's thesis, excuse me, PhD thesis, on genetic differentiation in scallops. And the Goolsboro Bay scallops were the most genetically distinct scallops that she tested along the coast. So it's a, it's a factor of the waters that they come from, also some genetic differences, and Maine produces amazing different varieties of scallops. They're really, uh, they're very, very good. And we need to do a much better job of differentiating them because right now we produce, we did produce less than 1%. Now we're producing between 2 and 3% of US sea scallops. They're produced much differently than the trip boat fishery. And for decades, we've been trucking them out of state to be mixed in with the stuff from the federal fishery. And the price that our guys get paid for their scallops is set by that offshore fishery. The management of that fishery now is better in the Gulf of Maine, for it's always been good outside the Gulf of Maine. Their quota is about to go up very high. They've been catching 30 to 40 million pounds for the past few years. They're about to be catching about 60 million, and the price is going to tank. In fact, when I was in Providence a couple of weeks ago, some of the guys were saying they're anticipating a price of $5 per pound for scallops. Now, that's fine for the trip boats. I don't care about them. But Maine, here in Maine, we're not producing that. And this upcoming weekend, when the northern Gulf of Maine fishery opens, our guys are going to be coming in with gorgeous day boat product that they're going to be paid a pittance for. So we need to do a better job of marketing our uh, seafood as distinct. Here in Maine, we have the Maine Lobster Marketing Collaborative, but we have nothing for seafood overall. And I've been doing my best funding myself from my small company and my waitressing shifts. We need, some, we need something more than that. We need a coalition. To, to benefit all Maine seafood because it's going to feed off each other. When people taste just how much better our scallops are, then they're going to realize, oh, why is that? We can talk, well, it's because the waters they come from. We have cold, clean waters of Maine, and they're harvested by you know, one man on one boat. And it's the same reason that our lobster is better. So it would help, it really would feed off all the other seafoods could benefit by massive, widespread seafood marketing. Um, one last thing I'm going to go up here. I am competing in the F FedEx Small Business Competition, and you can help by voting for me. So if you want to do something, you've got through now through April 4th to, uh, to go onto the FedEx Small Business Grant site and vote for Downey's Day Vote. You can vote once a day. Um, and what do you get if you win? If I, well, if the, the first cut is made but just on uh, vote numbers. Yeah. So the top 700 vote people, you know, vote, vote numbers, whatever, uh, will be analyzed, and then the so the top 100 will have to submit a video, some question. They haven't told us that yet. And then I would get $25,000 uh, with first place $25,000 plus $7,500 in FedEx services, which is good because I ship FedEx. And then there's a $10,000 and $5,000, whatever. I want, the, I want the grand prize, though. So, um, so that, now we're done. So. All right. Thank you. I haven't seen anything being a problem for the warming of the water. Well, yeah, the problem is that the scallops showed up on Stillwagon Bank probably partly because of that. And at one of the fisheries management meetings, the big boat guys were up there saying, I know there's nothing there now, but we can't give up our rights there because that might be where the resource goes with global warming. Um, I do know that the, the resource in the eastern part of the state is very different from the resource in the western part of the state. And I wonder if it's because of the currents and the waters are colder there. Maine's the only state with a real strong scallop fishery inshore because our waters are the only ones that are, have, are cold enough inshore to support a fishery. So it could be problems, problematic down the, down the road. Right now, it doesn't seem to be a problem. I can't, I can't tell from looking at them, but I can definitely taste the difference. Um, and there was actually, so one of the areas that we closed, Blue Hill Bay, uh, we opened it up in 2012, and almost all the scallops there were bright orange. I don't know if you can see. 
So you might have seen pink scallops, orange scallops before. Though, though that color is caused by ascaxanthin, which is a carotenoid that the females need to produce their roe. And the adductor muscle of a scallop is sort of like a gut on, on us. It's where this energy is stored. And so if they have an excess of that, of that carotenoid that they know they're going to need, they'll store it there. And so there must have been a lot of it in that area. And one of the dealers that I work with, he said, Toga, I could tell the scallops from Blue Hill Bay that were harvested in the closure versus outside the closure. And I suspect it's probably because the scallops that were inside the closure had not been disturbed. So they, had, they didn't have to bother um, repairing nicks in their shell and, and, and uh, overcoming the stress that they were put under. They could just store stuff. But they were bright orange. They were beautiful scallops. Mm -hmm. fixed. Uh, so does that mean uh, what's going to happen, uh, say, next, next Good year? question. So I, uh, as I realized I was running close on time, I sort of skirted over that. Um, it was fixed this year via a framework. In order to fix it long term, there needs to be an amendment, which is a much bigger deal. A framework was put in place that said, OK, the first 70,000 pounds goes to the day boat fleet. Everything above that is going to be divided between the day boat fleet and the trip boat fleet 50-50. The result of that was that the, it's because they decided based on a survey now that 200,000 pounds should be removed. So the small boats get 135,000 pounds, the big boats get 65,000. 65,000 pounds is so small an amount to the trip boats, they couldn't figure out what to do. They can't, they're not going to even bother coming up here for less than a million pounds because they can't divvy it up equally. So at some point, we need to come up with something that will allow them a share of it. And we, never said that we want to exclude them. Um, so down the road, we're going to have to come up with some long-term fix. But for right now, it's a fix that works pretty well for the day boats. So for the next few years anyway, we should be able to fish. Yes? How many day boats are there in Maine at this point? There aren't that many. So there are the day boats that are the IFQ permits, and then there are the Northern Gulf of Maine permits. There are a little over 100 day boats overall throughout the fishery, but they can stack their permits. I think there are only a couple Mainers that hold them. Um, there are right now, there are um, 109 Northern Gulf of Maine permits. Some of those are actually attached to much larger permits, so they're never going to actually be used. There are 41 Mainers that hold Northern Gulf of Maine permits, or at least there were as of a few months ago. Yes? Are, are the Gulf of Maine talent fisheries that MSC certified at all? No, and I have no interest in ever pursuing MSC certification because I don't have a whole lot of faith in it. I would love to. I mean, and I, I've, I'm a very busy person, and I've thought of like how to try to do it. Um, talked about maybe having a cooperative. Uh, I've, I've worked with a bunch of dealers that have offered. One of them's here. You know, allowed me to use their facility, and I've rented some space at facilities. And so there, I figure I don't, I don't want to ha reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of lobster dealers and processors that are pretty slow during the winter months. We don't need to form this new thing if we can just collaborate with other existing entities. So I, I certainly hope that something will happen. And uh, part of the reason it hasn't happened in the, you know, a long time ago when people didn't focus on scallops is that they never knew what was going to happen with scallops. Well, you didn't know if the main boats were going to bring in 80,000 pounds or 200,000. Now we're consistently bringing in over 500,000 pounds between December and March. So hopefully we can get our act together and, and, and do something along those lines, especially since now the Northern Gulf of Maine fishery will extend the availability of fresh scallops into April and sometimes even May. There's a species difference. So when you hear bay scallops, you're talking about, um, I believe it's Argopectin neradians, and it happens in the south. We are, we are just actually starting to have them appear in southern Maine. But that's a smaller scallop that lives in bays. And that can, they can tolerate warm water. So North Carolina has a fishery for them. Sea scallops are generally caught offshore. The federal fishery is almost all offshore. What's confusing is that in Maine, we have sea scallops that grow in our bays. So, and you can't tell by the size. Um, um, that's another whole story, but yeah. So different species. If you're buying a Maine scallop, you're buying a sea scallop. Ooh, I have to cover this. Reminds me. When you hear the term diver scallop, please be skeptical, because the vast majority of what's called a diver scallop was not actually harvested by a diver. Um, Rod Mitchell here at Brown Trading did a great job in the 1990s and early 2000s of marketing Maine diver scallops. 
Divers in Maine produce less than 2% of the scallops in Maine. They tend to go for the larger scallops. At the time, the federal fishery wasn't doing real well, and they had a lot of small scallops. So these big scallops were sort of a novelty, and they were branded diver scallops. And they commanded a premium, because you can make a really compelling argument, even though it's not as black and white as it sounds, that diving is more sustainable. <clears throat> then the federal fishery recovered, and they managed in a way to, to produce a lot of large scallops. And dealers realized they could get a lot more money by calling them diver scallops. So the majority of what is labeled a diver scallop is anything but. It doesn't matter whether it was harvested by a diver or a dragger. What matters is where it was harvested and how it was handled. And we should all be buying Maine scallops, and we should be stocking our freezer and using them all year round. <laughs> we have time for another one? Or? Hmm? Is there, did you have a question? Not yet, but there are people that are starting to farm for uh, farm scallops here in Maine waters. Um, a couple of my good friends actually do it, and it hasn't really taken off yet. It could. Um, one of the issues is that it's it's um, the cost effectiveness of growing a whole organism to throw out more than half of it. Um, there is a pilot program in the DMR is running to test for biotoxins. The reason that we only eat the white meat, the adductor muscle in a scallop, there's actually a lot more to a scallop. You open up the shell, and there's what we eat is one small part. There's a lot more, and most cultures around the world eat the rest of it, or at the very least, they'll eat the roe, which can weigh as much as the adductor muscle. But here in the Gulf of Maine, we have an issue with biotoxins, and those biotoxins can accumulate in the digestive tract, and there's a little piece of the digestive tract that goes through the roe. And unlike mussels and clams, um, that when the toxins are present, they eat them and they, they store them, and then when the toxin leaves, they purge it. Scallops will retain it, and they actually biotransform it into something even more deadly. So you could theoretically die from eating one scallop in December when there haven't been you know, toxic algae in the water for months. So DMR doesn't want to you know, screw around with that because they don't want to kill anybody. <laughs> yes. Anybody else? Oh, one last thing. Down East Day Boat Scallops make really good Christmas gifts. And I always <laughs> offer local discounts, so I'll put in a coupon code LOCAL207, and you can ship across the country and delight all your friends and family. <laughs> oh, one, one more. In the daily limit of, what, 200, 400 pounds, how much of it is actually the scallop meat that you eat and how much you weigh in the shell? No, you don't weigh the shell. So it's they're, 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 weighing, uh, they're weighing just the, the adductor muscles themselves. And it depends on where you are. You can get 10 to a pound, 20 to a pound. And here in Maine, our limits are actually, we don't do a, a weight limit. Uh, the northern Gulf of Maine is a 200 pound limit. Inshore waters, it's either two five gallon buckets of meats or three five gallon buckets of meat. So it works out to be 90 pounds or, or 135 pounds. All right. All right. Thank you. Carl. Thank you.